The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. They were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, followed, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and when she and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Be seated, please. Just for a minute, cast your minds back to what Mondays were like in the pre-COVID era. Nobody woke up on Monday morning thinking, oh, I'm going to have a lion today. And nobody sort of said, oh, I'm going to have a leisurely brunch sometime this morning. Monday morning was a work day, right? It was just, in, in, for most people at least, it was a, it was a work day, uh, just an ordinary day. In the first century, the first day of the week was Sunday. It was like a Monday in our time. In fact, for most of the Roman world, it was a business day, and then most of the days were like Monday. They were work days. But among the Jews in Judea, in the Roman province of Judea, Uh, There was a Sabbath that was kept on what we would call Saturday. And that was sort of different. The the Romans were were the kind of imperialists who always allowed the local people to follow as much of their customs as they could, as long as they did it peacefully and didn't get in the way of Roman uh, business and Roman military uh, power or anything like that, or Roman authority. So the 
Jewish people could keep their Sabbath. And there was probably around Jerusalem a kind of quietness that, that, that sort of enshrouded the Sabbath. Again, for those of you that are old enough, when you remember Sundays in New Jersey before they, before they uh, got rid of the, the so-called blue laws that didn't, uh, you know, when there was no shopping on Sundays and things like that. It was a quiet day. And the first day of the week, in the pre-dawn, Mary Magdalene, one of the disciples of Jesus, one of the followers of Jesus, it gets up to go to the tomb. You can only imagine what she was saying. It's just an ordinary day, just a working day, and yet she's on her way to the tomb to, to, to visit the grave of the one that she had loved, the one who had showed her something about herself that, that made her feel like a whole person uh, again. I, mean, I don't know why we go to graves. Um, we do still, at least in my tradition, in my family, we go to visit the graves of the people that we love. Um, it's a way of, I guess it's a way of grieving. It's a way of showing respect. It's a way of connecting in some ways. Uh, I don't know why we don't do it, but we do it. We all, uh, at least as I say, that's our tradition, my tradition, and probably some of yours, where you just go and it's a, it's a sign of respect. It's a sign of well, whatever it is, you, you, you tell me. And Mary was doing that. And probably on the way thinking, thank God for ritual, because it helps us to get over uh, the grief. And in her case, not just grief, but shock and horror. I mean, if you start to think of what the disciples, including Mary Magdalene, went through on what we celebrated in, the past, in this past week, the tumultuous events. In the first place, Jesus, Jesus came and, and uh, to Mary, or appear, you know, as he, as he did to the other disciples, he, he came and appeared as a person who spoke with authority. What does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that he was a, a boss or a bully or you know, told people off or bullied them around. It meant that he seemed to be authentic. Can I see the, you see the connection of the words. He was authentic. He, in, in fact, was connected to the author of life. And there was this sense of, of, of authority, of something about Jesus that grasped Mary and other disciples. Now, Mary was a, you know, we don't know a whole lot about her. The tradition says she was a prostitute. There's question about that, because in the first century, to be fair, any woman that had to earn her own living was looked upon with a jaundiced eye because women, decent women, were supposed to be under the authority or connected and supported by some man. That's just the way it was. Mary apparently wasn't, and so all sorts of things might have been said about her, and perhaps she was a prostitute. Who knows? And really, what difference does it make? The fact is that Mary, um, in, because of her association with Jesus, came to recognize that she, as a person, was valued and she was valued by God, that she could call God her Father, just as Jesus taught us all to say, our Father. That she could be, have, you know, could have an intimate relationship with God himself, because God loved her and cared for her. Something that the other disciples, each in their own different ways, and probably for their own different reasons, all of them sort of sensed something about Jesus. So that when they saw him, uh, you know, sort of with, with this kind of teaching which was bringing to life the, the, the teaching of the Hebrew faith, the Jewish faith that they, had, that, that they had known and were to a certain extent not a major part of, were on the outsides or near the borderlines of, of the Jewish community, the, the respectable religious community. And they were made to feel that they, we, we belong and so to see Jesus entering Jerusalem and the children shouting hosannas and, and all this sort of joyfulness and something is happening. This is a moment. This is a grand kind of thing. And then the events of the week kind of were good, perhaps, as Jesus, you know, cleansed the temple and did other things. And, but there was also trouble brewing. And they saw that, probably feel it. And on the night before, the week he now is the night before he, uh, in which he was betrayed, when Jesus gathered on that night to celebrate the Passover with his disciples, there was a kind of intimacy, but there must have been a sense of, and Mary would have remembered this, there's a kind of sense that 
something was wrong, something was in the air, and it was, and that night he was betrayed in the garden and taken into custody first by the Jewish authorities and then in the morning handed over to the Romans and sentenced to death. Their world would have been destroyed. Their disappointment is, you know, as, as you would be disappointed if everything you had worked for was suddenly smashed in front of you. But it was the Sabbath. They had to get him into the ground quickly. And then they could do nothing more. They had, to, they had to sit out the Sabbath because you couldn't be seen to be moving about and doing chores or tasks, even uh, taking care of a grave. And so on that first day of the week, in the pre-dawn, Mary is going out to the tomb to do her ritual mourning. And when she gets there, horror of horrors, it's open and empty. If you've ever had your home broken into and come home to it, you have a somewhat of an idea of what she must have felt at that point. Not only the disappointment and heartbreak of the past week, the death of a beloved teacher, but now this. And so she does all she can. She runs and finds the other disciples who were apparently cowering together in some place and brings Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. They always so said that way. We Tradition assumes that to be John. In fact, John who's responsible uh, for the writing of that gospel by his that has his name. Um, she brings the, the, the disciples, run to the tomb. Um, Peter clearly was not the one who was fit because the other disciple got there first. But uh, he waits respectfully, so that Peter was probably older, you can guess. And he go, Peter goes in first into the tomb. They see the empty tomb, everything decent and in order, all folded and uh, all the cloths and everything folded. They don't quite know what to make of it, but it said that the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, he believed. Well, I'm not sure at that point what he believed, but he believed. And then they left. And Mary was left on her own. And as the story unfolds, she's weeping and she sees angels in the tomb and they say to her, woman, why are you weeping? She says, they take you. And then, then Jesus himself comes to her and stands near her and says the same quest, asks the same question, why are you weeping? And she says, they've taken my, if you've taken him, sir, tell me where you've laid him and I'll tell you. know, she, she's wanting to, 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 how should we say, deal with the damage that was done. If you've taken him, just tell me and I'll take him away. And then Jesus calls her by name. That's when she recognizes him. And of course, he apparently wants to, to grasp onto him. And he says, you know, you don't grasp onto me that way. I've not yet ascended to the Father. You know, the church very wisely says that we celebrate Easter as a 50-day festival. And I think the emphasis of that, you know, we begin it today. We began it technically last night uh, at the Easter Eve vigil at the end of the vigil when we celebrated the first Eucharist of Easter Day, we begin uh, to celebrate this festival. And the church wisely says it should be, you know, keep it over a period of 50 days because in a sense it reminds us that this, what happened in the resurrection of Jesus wasn't something that sort of became a, a, an apparent thing as, oh, that's all it's about. Okay, we've got this. No, it was something that grew on people. They, began, they had to mull it over. They had to, you know, digest what was going on, what this, what this meant. They had to, inter, you know, bring it to themselves, think about it. And, and we hear that process going on still in the, read, the first reading today from the Acts of the Apostles <coughs> is the story of Peter when he was called to the house of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, not a Jew, and it was perhaps the first time, at least the first time noted in scripture, 
when um, a non-Jew was received into the community of faith, was baptized. But Peter went along, and, and, and you could hear him in the, in the reading if you, well, go back and read it if you weren't listening or you know, couldn't hear it carefully, clearly or weren't thinking about it. Go back and read it and see that Peter was kind of working this through. Oh, it's apparent to me that what God means is that this, this faith in Jesus is for everybody. You can see the process of growth, but at the, you know, at, at the development, the thinking about the implications of what this means, and in a sense, all through the 50 days of Easter, in our scripture readings, you're going to be hearing about the church kind of Christian people, the disciples, us, the disciples of Jesus, waking up to what this means. And Mary was being told, in a sense, one of the first lessons of what this means, that Jesus lives, that he's risen from the dead, that he's no longer you know, captive to a death, but is opening to us the gates of eternal life. And the first thing she realizes is you can't grasp onto this and clutch it like some pre precious treasure. It's not meant, to, Jesus is not meant to be clutched and held. Our faith isn't meant to be clutched and held. It's meant to be shared. I've not yet ascended to my Father. I've not yet become, uh, the, you know, available, you might say, to all the world. But this is what you need to do. You need to not clutch onto Jesus, not clutch onto religion. It's a precious thing. But to share it with, with everyone around us. Yeah, that means sort of sometimes grandiose things like, you know, the old feeding the hungry and bringing, you know, you know doing all the, the just and righteous actions that Christian people do that all, all of us, I think, I hope, you know, try to engage in. But it also means just in daily life, just trying to share the joy of Jesus, the fact that we know that every life is valued and no life is to be disrespected. And, and we could just, you know, the way that we deal with each other can just show that because that is pointless but share the love of Jesus so that they can be saved. And that's, that's one of the first lessons. I think that's the lesson that Mary Magdalene, the first thing she grasped, that you can't grasp Jesus, but you share him. There's a wonderful prayer that was written by, um, what was his name, Charles Brent, I think, Henry Charles Brent, something like that. He was a 20th century missionary. Um, and he spoke, this, he, the prayer is in the prayer book. It says, it talk, it's a prayer to Jesus, and that you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that you might draw the whole world to yourself. Now, through the power of your spirit, help us to stretch out our arms of love, that we might share that good news with other people, and that the rest of the world might know through acts of love and justice and caring, the love of Jesus. And this is the first step to understanding what eternal life, everlasting life, is all about. But it's not a process that comes like one boom, revelation, there it is, you've got it all, all that you need. It's a joyful thing, this resurrection of Jesus that we celebrate. What does it mean for us all through our lives, from childhood to adulthood, we continually grow. It's not, we don't have to, it's, it's not just a matter in church of teaching children, it's teaching us old guys too, because we learn every day more and more about what Jesus is about. Because he lives, he's always out ahead of us, always moving us, guiding us, directing us, pulling us toward, well, eternal life. So, now we begin the 50 days. Now we begin the celebration of life itself. Now we begin, hopefully, once again, to renew our commitment to just to just be open to the love of Jesus and to know more and more and more. Sort of like that universe that, that scientists say, I, you know, I can barely understand it, but that it's sort of continually expanding our knowledge and love of God that is brought to us by Jesus Christ and the triumph of Jesus over death itself. You know, all of this is, is a knowledge and, and, and a sense that's continually expanding to broaden our life, open our life, so that we might know more fully that everlasting life, that eternal life that Jesus promises, the one who brings us the living water, the one who brings us, um, 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 who is the, the good shepherd of the sheep, the one who, you know, cares for his people. This is the one about whom we'll hear all through Easter time.
and is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.